The name Uncle Bunks comes from my dad, Larry. Uh, he grew up as Bunky, that was his nickname. We think it's a backwoods, West Virginia, hillbilly way of saying junior. Because we know lots of Bunks who are juniors. So he was Lawrence Richard Young Jr. That's a big mouthful, so he's called Bunky. Um, these are his family recipes, so our, when they get the pictures up, you'll be able to see my family. Um, they're his family recipes. This was his hobby. He lived really in West Virginia. <coughs> And on a hill, on a working farm, and Postway Ridge. Yeah, he's from Postway Ridge. Um, so he grew up with a mother and a grandmother who grew up in a garden and canned everything. And this was this was the way life worked back then. They didn't have running water, inside running water. I don't know until the 50s, I think. Um, these are the first slides from a presentation that I did to try to get us some capital, so, um, to, to an economic development group. Uh, go back to the, is it? Uh, this is my dad, Uncle Buck himself. This is him canning. This is my mom, obviously, him canning pickles. Um, I think the best way to show you who we are and what we do is if this will come up, let's click on that one. Um, traveling West Virginia, have you guys ever seen that on, if you live in the Charleston area? They came in, it didn't work, did it? Um, they came in and there's a, about a minute spot uh, where they did a video of us and it's me talking about my family, our products, all that kind of stuff. Um, and I think it's the best way to show you who we are and what we do. We are an internationally sold company, that means our products are even sold in Hong Kong. Right now we're cutting a deal with Japan. We still make our products in my parents' basement. We turned it into a manufacturing facility. I don't have the kind of facility Calvin has. So I'm kind of in between. I work, I want to be where Calvin is. <laughs> and I'm going to talk to you about how we've gotten to where we are and how we're going to get to be what I'd like to be, which is the Stonewall Kitchen of West Virginia. Um, our 14 day sweet pickles, I think you guys got a chance to try those, the original recipe. They take 14 days to make. From the time they go in the jar, have you all pickled before? Do you know what kind of labor is involved in that? This is my number one seller, that jar right there. This is my number one seller. Out of every other SKU number we have, that's the number one seller. It is 14 days of labor. This pickle retails on our website for $9. It wholesales for five dollars, and it's almost a lost leader because the cucumber. There's about a pound of cucumbers in each jar. If cucumber prices skyrockets, you know, if it drops, I make a little more money. If it skyrockets, I, you know, at wholesale, I don't make a whole lot. It's hard to break that five dollar barrier. That's why I bring that up because I'm going to talk about pricing and, and how to price your products and what profit margins are in the food industry in a little bit. Oh, we were in Country Living Magazine that as America's best regional, as the best regional pickle. So from this area, we were the best pickle. These are our hot sweet pickles. I think you had a chance to try those. Those have won every award in the hot food industry. SCOBY, Fire Your Food Challenge, all of that. on the Today Show, we were featured on the Today Show, and I'll try to get that up to show you that spot. Um, and we were featured on the Today Show because we won what's called a Sophie Award. And it is the highest honor in the food industry, in the specialty food industry. Um, an organization called the NASFT, National Association for the Specialty Food Trade, they run an awards program, and it's international, it's every, every special product in the world. And we won a silver for um, the condiment category for our mustard relish hot. Um, what they do is like the Oscars, they pick five nominees or four nominees, and then you go to a big red carpet awards ceremony and they, and they announce the winner, just like the Oscars. They, and I didn't bring it with me, but we have an award that looks like an Oscar. And it's silver, it's really heavy. So we were featured on the Today Show, and they did a really nice job.
job talking about us being from West Virginia and being DMA'd. Um, this product has also won the SCOBY Award, just a bunch of hot foods awards in Texas, and um, we've even won out at Napa Valley at the uh, Mustard Festival. This is our rusty pepper sauce, crossed between a salsa and a spicy ketchup. Again, it's won SCOBY Awards and Fire Food Challenge Awards. We call it our version of a salsa. We didn't call it a salsa on the label because we do not want to compete in the salsa market. The salsa market, it's very hard to compete with a specialty salsa. So this is a spread, a uh, cross between a hot sauce. It's just a very unique product and we can compete that way on price. Um, we have about 26 products. We have four on the market right now. We are gonna repackage these for the high end gift and gourmet industry. Um, we saw them at fairs and festivals. This size bottle goes for $5. Wholesale, two sixty. dollars they have nice profit margins. Uh, much better than the, the stuff in the glass jars. Um, and we know that the chili in a bottle will probably be our number one seller if we package it correctly and put it in the right target market. We have every fair and festival and trade show there is. We did 50 some events last year from samplings at specialty food stores to something like we did on Tuesday going to DC to do a sampling. Um, we also do fairs and festivals. We're going to be at a festival this weekend in Charleston. Um, next weekend we'll be in Ripley. So um, we make the product all week, we sell it all weekend. Very rarely do we have a weekend off. Sometimes my mom and dad will get a weekend off and I'll be somewhere. My mom just took, let's see, this past Saturday they were in Charleston at the Vandalia event along with the 150th. She then went to Pittsburgh to be with her other grandchildren for a while, my sister's kids. My dad ran things while I went to DC. Now we're all back home and they're leaving for Charleston this weekend and I get a little time off. So that's kind of how we do it, but we're always somewhere because we need to be telling you about our product so you'll go somewhere and buy it. We do. We do. But if you think about it, that can't be the reason that we're there just for that money right there. I'm there to sample the product, you get to talk to me, I get you to really love my product. So when you see it at the Southern Season, that's in North Carolina, and Home Goods, and uh, but every, just about every gift shop, especially food store in West Virginia, carries on the bums. What we do is we hope you see it in there, you really like the product, you tried it at a fair festival, and you'll take a jar home. Because that's really where we want to be. We want to be a manufacturer and a wholesaler not someone that goes to every fair and festival just because it's wearing us out. And the cost, even though I'm selling the pickles at retail, if, if you figure my gas, my time, um, the hotel, the cost of being at the show, the cost of the booth, you know, you're really not, your profit margin is pretty much the same as at wholesale. As you can tell, you know, we pick up our produce. We, we, they can't get up our hill. We live on a hill, so box trucks can't get up our hill. So we pick up our produce in a pickup truck, and our employees unload. And it's very much a, um, we're very much still doing things the same way that a small company would do them. And, and I don't know that will ever change, because as you change production ways, like if you're using a, um, an automatic filler and things like that, then you're going to introduce oxygen into the products. And you know, there's just a lot of things that change them. Our products will most likely, even as we grow, stay hand dipped. Um, or we'll use a gravity filler, something like that, just to keep the integrity of the product. My dad retired from the chemical industry, and he had a lot of family members who really loved the products that he made um, because they were from. They had grown up with them. So they said, you should sell these, you should sell these. So we entered the awards called the SCOBY Awards, and they have an amateur division, and our mustard won 
first place in its category in grant prize overall, and they pretty much called us and said, look, you, you kicked tail. You know, your, your scores kicked tail against the professionals. You've got a great product. The rustic pepper sauce came in second in its category, so we had two marketable products. We flew out to Albuquerque, New Mexico, and went to the trade show, talked to a lot of people in the industry, and thought we'd take a chance. Um, we started the company in December of 2003, and, and the way I got involved was I got laid off, laid off from my job in the biotech industry in sales and marketing in early 2003. So I thought, well, I'll just help them. They'll be fun. It's a challenge. You know, I'll figure out how to bring a, a food product to market. So it took us six months to put in our commercial kitchen to get the labeling, figure out the labeling laws, figure out how to bring this product to market, and they went on sale July 1st of 2004. So we'll be celebrating nine years coming up this July 4th, 1st. I would hope that we would grow very quickly. Um, so nine years later, we're sold very well. Um, we're still regional, we're still small, we're still barely profitable. You know, so why is that? Um, and why that is, is because there's very limited access to, there's been very limited access to capital. Cut my costs or bring down my costs. I need to buy all of my produce in season. Because if I'm buying it off the open market out of season, I'm paying a lot more for it. So I'm really kind of like a farmer where I need to buy all the seeds, plant, harvest and then sell it and then I can pay back you know and so for me it would be buying all the seeds is buying glass jars the labels the lids all the ingredients all the labor during the season so if I have hundred fifty two hundred thousand dollars in sales a year I really need a hundred thousand dollars to run things you know right up front we haven't had that so we've been financing ourselves based on what we sell so that really limits us to producing during the growing season. I love to buy local. I would love to buy every pepper and cucumber and everything local. It's who we want to be. Um, it's something called value-based marketing, if you want like the big marketing words, starting to think about where our food comes from. So when I go to Whole Foods, to talk to them about carrying our product, or I go to somewhere, and they say, where do you get your produce? Well, during the growing season, I buy as much as I can, because I sit right on the Ohio River from Ohio and West Virginia, um, but I can't get it all. I used 6,000 pounds of cucumbers last year. I'm not gonna pay retail price for your cucumbers, for your product. I'm not gonna buy a pound or two. I need boxes. I mean, we get five or six boxes of cucumbers a week, and that's when we're not in heavy production. 48 pound boxes. Um, so for me, I need to buy wholesale. So why is it advantageous for you as a farmer to sell it to me wholesale? Because I'm going to buy in volume. So if you're left with crop, if you can't sell it at the market, what are you going to do with it? I think that farmers who have said, I'll have product for you. Yes. When they take it, they have it on the truck and they go to the farmer's market and then because they can sell it there, you're kind of up the creek. I'm up the creek. Because I need I need a certain amount of cucumbers, a batch is a certain amount. So, and I have employees coming in, we need to run that batch of, of cucumbers. If I don't have the right poundage, I can't make the product or the right mix of peppers. So if Dale says to me, Stacy, I got you covered. I got 300 pounds of Hungarian wax for you. And I'll have them there on Monday. Okay? So I've got everyone lined up, ready to go. Dale calls me and says, you know what, Stacy, I had a run on this Hungarian wax. And I only have 100 pounds for you. I'm screwed. What am I going to do? Where am I going to get 200 pounds of Hungarian wax when he called me Monday morning? Because now i got to buy those off the, the open market. And they got to go to you know, wherever they're buying from, and then get them to me. Sometimes I can get them by Tuesday morning, but mostly I can't. I don't know where those peppers came from. You know, I have no control then over where my produce is coming from, but I have orders to fill. I've got employees coming in. What am I going to do? So that's kind of where, that's kind of where we've gotten burnt by, by dealing with local farmers because they don't know how to sell 
yourself to a company that's, that's requiring to have produce there in the right quantity so that we can produce. So that's been a real issue for us. buy everything up front and then make it all and then hold it and sell it for the whole year. So we're kind of on time production. So I've got money coming in. I've got enough to make six batches this week. I'm going to make my six batches this week and then send them out and then I'm going to do that again. So we're kind of on time production. Um, it's more expensive to buy things out of season or when you just have to have it. So that's kind of the struggle, what we struggle with as a small business. And for us, um, it doesn't fit with who we are. These are my great grandmother's recipes. Um, my dad grew a garden for years. We want to be using produce from here. We want to put our money back into West Virginia's economy. Um, I spent forty or fifty thousand dollars last year on produce. I'd like it to go to you, the farmer, as opposed to the wholesale guy. higher price product, you're going to pay $9 in a store, $9 or $10 in a store for those pickles. You're going to pay 7 or 8 for that jar of mustard. Um, and the reason we're a little higher than, say, our competitors, other local food companies, is because we're not a hobby business. This is what we do full time. We want to be sustainable. So if I go to a fair festival and I sell it for wholesale, you know, I can't do that. And that's what a lot of a lot of people do. That's why you're going to see our products be more expensive than what you can buy at the farmer's market. Um, when you price your product to sell, um, you got to think about three different prices. Okay, first there's the retail price. Okay, then there's the wholesale price. The difference is what the store makes. Some stores want to make a whole boatload of money. They mark up 100%. Most of those are gift shops. And the reason their pricing is like that is because they're selling something that you're going to buy one time. So they need to get the maximum profit from it the one time you're in that gift shop. Our product sells incredibly well at gift shops even though they're doubling it. Because people are looking at it as a gift, as a special purchase, that kind of thing. But I have to think about that. I have to think about the fact that my pickle is going to be $10 in a gift shop. Now, when you go into a specialty food store, I just spoke to one in D.C. Well, I did a bunch of sales calls while I was there, and I asked him, I said, what's your profit margin need to be on my product? Like, what are you going to mark it up for? And he's going to be much more reasonable. It's going to end up being between $7 and $8 on his shelf, even, excuse me, once he gets there. So it's just the different profit margins in the specialty food versus the gift and gourmet um, markets. But I have to think about all that when I'm pricing my product. Then there's the wholesale price. That's what, you know, the difference between the cost and the wholesale price is what I make. I make significantly less than the gift shop makes, significantly less than, than everyone else, um, especially if I use a distributor. So a distributor's going to buy my product, he's going to mark it up for a profit margin and sell it to a gift shop or a specialty food store or whatever. He's also going to handle the transportation. Where on my way to DC, I made lots of deliveries. Okay, I was my own delivery person, and I did that to sell product. I called your store and I said, "Hey, I'll deliver for free. Place an order." So I got, I, I basically got my trip paid for. If you think about it, by making those deliveries on the way. The distributor is going to buy in big volume on skids. They're going to come and pick it up, and they're going to take care of getting it where it needs to go, even selling it to new stores. But I got to give them money for that. And sometimes it can be as much as 25%. Okay? So now you've cut me even more. Now I'm making barely anything. So to be a successful food business, to be considered successful, if at the end of the year you have a 10% profit margin, you are successful. Think about that. I gotta do a million dollars in sales to profit a hundred thousand dollars. Okay? So that's why Uncle Bunks is barely profitable, because 
we don't do a million dollars in sales, you know? So, and, and so I don't have the money to invest back into the company to do the advertising and to get the distributor and that kind of thing. Because you can get, I can get a distributor, but if he doesn't sell it and it sits there, he's going to make me buy it back. So, and that's the way it works. If you sell to Kroger and it doesn't sell, they make you buy it back. Or they destroy the product and charge you for it. So, these are the things I've got to make sure that I have a big enough clientele to buy a $9 or $10 pickle. And I tell you this to understand the realities. It's not, it's, it's a difficult business. It's a hard business. Um, but there's a demand for these products right now, even at the price points that I have to sell them at to, to make a living. So that's kind of how that works. Um, and then there's the emotional demand for them when we don't can anymore. As a culture, we don't can anymore. So nobody is making 14-day sweet pickles. So we have a lot of people who order our product from all over the country whose grandmother used to make this. And it made them cry to try the product. You know, so they got teary-eyed just eating the product or the mustard. Oh my God, this is my grandmother's sandwich bread. That's what we called it. You know, and we get notes from all over. Please don't ever stop making those pickles. Oh, we love your mustard. It's addictive. It makes us happy. Emotion attached to food, especially if they make a memory. And these products that we're trying to keep alive make our memories for a lot of people. And we have many more we'd like to bring out onto the market. It's expensive to do that. Yeah, we're kind of a, a special case where we entered these products and they won a major award. And they continue to win. The Sophie Award that we have is the only product in West Virginia. I mean, that's, that's it. The lifetime of the Sophie Awards, the last 40 years, no product from West Virginia has ever won one. Just ours, our mustard relish. So, and, and that's, that's a hot pepper butter. You all know hot pepper butter. We know it here in West Virginia. We all make it. I can't believe I can sell it at $8 <laughs> in stores here. But um, because everyone makes it, but people outside of West Virginia don't know what a pepper butter is. You can't just make a product and stick it on the market. You've got to position that product and think about the packaging. I mean, I walked into a store yesterday to make a delivery, and she was all talking about how great my packaging is. And she says, I'm going to show you an example of really bad packaging. And it happens to be another company that I know, a different category, not food, another company that I know very well, and they recently changed their packaging. And they designed it to go into high-end gift shops. And she was telling me why it was a bad decision. Why that soap, oh, I shouldn't have said soap, but anyway, why that soap wasn't selling in her shop. Why another one was. So as we get ready to change our packaging, not on these products, but on another product, it is really good for me to hear because I can have the best product in the world. But if, if the store owner can't move it, and they're not in, if I can't sell it to the store owner and the store owner sell it to you, then I don't move my product. What were some of those tips? What did, what did you find? Um, it didn't look homemade anymore. Uh, Okay, it didn't look homemade anymore. It was in a slick package. Um, and so another soap that was looked more homemade was selling better against it. And she's showing me my product versus some other company that she picked up from, from Pennsylvania. And she's like, your product sells better because it looks homemade. Good to hear because she is my target market. That store owner is who's going to keep me in business. Um, I can go to every fair and festival in the world and I'm never gonna grow enough. But if I can sell it to the store owner, and if I know what she wants to put on her shelf, and what she thinks about it, she's gonna transfer that to her customers. She told me I need to have a sampling program. She says, everybody has a sampling program. I know that. I know I need a sampling program. I'm just too small to put it into action. There's a couple ways you can do it. For every case that they buy, they get a jar free and that jar is marked sample, and, and therefore they can't sell it, they need to sample it to their customers. Because we believe that if you try our product, you buy our product. Um, if you don't try it, you're probably never gonna buy it. Um, I could also do something like, for every three cases you buy, you get a jar, you get 50 little cups and 50 little spoons to sample the product with. On the chili in a bottle, I could do like a bottle of chili, and 50 cups and spoons, something like that. We just 
really haven't put that into play yet because that takes time, energy, usually a flyer or some kind of an email. You gotta pay somebody to package up those 50 little spoons and those 50 little cups. You gotta buy those 50 little spoons and those 50 little cups. So those are the kinds of things that when you're, um, when you're running on low cash, you just can't do. back in December, when I had a little cash, and we took out ads in Gourmet News that we're gonna run all year. So every month there's a different ad in Gourmet News. And so I brought some of them. The big coup is the one that says Made in America. Did you, does, does someone have that one that they can show up? Hold up. So that, that's it, hold it up. See where it says, no, turn around. Stewart says Gourmet News, Made in America. That was their Made in America supplement. You see, we have two, our, one of our pictures is on the cover. Oh, wow. Right there. So, see the mustard. Um, so that's a national, we basically have a national ad campaign going now. Every time one of those magazines hits the consumers, we can tell, and the consumers are retail shops, they're specialty food shops, they're whatever, because we get phone call after phone call, so we shipped out 70 boxes of samples. Let's think about how much that costs. Um, they're not paying me for that. We've shipped out 70 boxes of samples, but we've picked up a store in Bend, Oregon. We've picked up stores in Virginia. We've picked up stores all over the place that are direct buying from us. This is my kind of strategy to get a distributor. So if I go to a distributor and say, hey, I have these 40 stores in your territory, you know, pre-made for you, you're gonna have to buy my product. And then, and then the stores get it a little cheaper because they're not paying the, sh the direct shipping. Because remember, I'm shipping 60, 70, 80 pounds to Bend, Oregon. Do you know how much that costs? On top of the cost of the product. Because the consumer, pick or the store picks that up. So that's kind of my game plan, that's why I did this. Um, it's close to working. You know, every month I cross my fingers and see if I'm gonna get new calls. Uh, we just got a distributor who is very interested. They're evaluating our products now. Uh, the meeting I had yesterday in DC was with a chain. I thought they had four or five stores based on the name, but they're affiliated with another store brand, and they have 50 stores. shifts in my tiny little kitchen because I can't make pickles and mustard at the same time. I physically can't use the space that way. So I have to run, pickles have to be run every day and there's something to them every day and we stagger them so you're canning pickles every day, you're boiling alum every day, you're boiling juice every day. Um, so, and, then, and then you gotta have people sitting there cutting all the peppers and the cucumbers and everything and then you gotta make it and bottle it. We need more space or I'm gonna have to run multiple shifts. So where am I going to get my employees? I don't know. I pray and they show up. <laughs> they do. I pray and they show up. The ag teacher in Tyler County, uh, Leon, Leon, I think is his name. Uh, we have a um, ag intern right now, one of his students. Uh, she's paid for from the Farm to School program. So we have her for 125 hours this summer. Um, she's fantastic. I was really worried about bringing in a 16 year old, but she's fantastic. But my dad is 71, you know, and he's running our production. You know, she's just, she's just, Stacey, what do you want me to do now? What, I'm like, eat your lunch. You know, take a breath. <laughs> so we've had um, young people in. Uh, we've had several guys that worked in kitchens, um, restaurant kitchens that came to work for us. Our problem has been that we can't keep them busy. 40 hours a week. We can give them a 40 hour week job. Each of them probably only got 20 hours this week. You know, they, did, they don't have 40 hour week jobs. We also have a lady who works for us in the morning, she works for the dollar store in the afternoon. You know, we have a lady who works for us in the afternoon and she cleans in the morning. Or do 
that we co-pack the product. So, and those are two very different business models. Um, we chose to make the product because at that time we couldn't find a production facility that would make that would use five different kinds of peppers. They wanted to use one kind of pepper, or they wanted to use freeze-dried peppers, or you know, to get the cost down. This is what we do. We only use beet sugar. We don't use regular sugar. We don't use your percentage of vinegar. We dilute it. Um, all of those things are going to drastically change the product. It's why our food all tastes the same because economies of scale are true. You know, if I can buy a tanker truck or tanker rail car of vinegar that's 50% or whatever and dilute it down to what percentages I need, then I'm making a whole lot more money than if I'm buying the good stuff. We want to keep alive real food, real products. We're really committed to not co-packing because we want to do it ourselves. We want to we want to bottle it the way that our my grandmother did. Yes, we do use a big cooker that's this big, but we're not using forced air bottling and things of that nature. So the products taste the way they should. Um, and we know other companies who have gone from our size to national chains doing or going into national chains doing the same thing we've done. We've talked to a lot of them and said, how do you do this? How do you run it? You know, um, how do you make the pickles on a national level? How do you make enough? And we've, we've kind of got that figured out. Um, if I were to bottle a hot sauce, we'd like to bring out, one of my game plan is if I'm gonna market these products, I can market other products too, right? You know, the more products I have, the more people are gonna buy. We'd like to bring out some products specifically for the hot foods industry. Yes, our mustard and our pepper sauce made the same way we make it, but a hot sauce, our recipe, but I'm not bottling hot sauce. Those bottles are really hard. It's really hard to hand bottle those. So I would probably have that line co-packed. Um, but I would change the marketing on it because I don't want to sell that as handmade. You know, we'll probably put that under a different label uh, with a different name. just to test the market. There's another thing you would suggest as far as like testing out the target market. Farmers markets are the best. We do we do a lot of farmers markets. Um, we do fairs and festivals in every in small towns and big towns, but we, we try to see what sells in Columbus versus what sells in West Virginia, what sells in Cincinnati, and try to see what the popular products are. I've tested price. I've gone to a show one weekend and the price has been one thing. I've gone to another show in another area and the price is with the kind of the same demographics and changed the price, lowered it or raised it to see how it would sell. So, because I need to know, I need to know what price it's going to sell for in the store so I can back down that wholesale price and see if I can. We can find a food competition to enter your products into that they can really give you good feedback. Editors of blogs will give you good feedback too. You know, so if you somebody writes a food blog, you can send it into them and say, hey, here's a case of free product. Tell me what you think about it. Or three jars of free product. Tell me what you think about it. Um, we have an opportunity to go into a really big into into some distribution and some other West Virginia product. These are companies like us smaller ones, um, and I haven't put the pickles in the mix. The feedback I've gotten is that they won't buy it for the price I need it to be. So if I go into this store and the pickles are sitting on the shelf for $9, they're not going to move. So we're going to push the mustard and the pepper sauce because I have more profit margin in those and have more leeway to lower the price. You know, the total investment of the kitchen, the, 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 you know how much a graphic designer costs to design a label? To 
change a label, our address just changed. There's a lot of cost involved in the food industry, and there's small margins. And just about anywhere in the food industry, you'll find smaller margins than other industries. I run our company very differently now than I did nine years ago. I don't spend money on anything that we don't ask. My website is $19.99 a month. That's what I pay, $19.99 a month for that website. It's okay. Hey, it does its job. I get orders every day off that website. We, as we get bigger and as we grow and as we're, we're trying to do get more water distribution, do I need something a little better? Yes. Do I need a back end for wholesale customers to order, to go in, log into their account, see what they recently ordered, and place another order? Yeah, it'll save me labor time. You know, my, I won't have to pay an employee to call that person or to take that phone call. You know, so I can get, I can spend my time getting the customer, and then they can kind of maintain themselves because they can order at 2 a.m. They don't, they're busy, they don't want to be bothered by me making phone calls. So yeah, we need those types of things. Um, <coughs> But we don't need them till we need them, and that's that's the diff that's the way I run the company now. We don't need it till we need it. First time that we've used high school, and it's working out really well. So we will probably do more things with them. Um, we have college interns who do a lot of our marketing material, um, and I usually hire juniors, seniors in college because they're familiar with all the programs. Um, they're self starters usually. We have a guy right now. Um, we have an opportunity to go on several online sellers, online retailers, Open Sky, Amazon, a bunch of them, and I haven't had time to do it. I haven't had eight hours to sit down and figure out how to upload everything onto Amazon's website. So I hired an intern to do that. He has 10 years, he's been selling on eBay since he was 15 years old. He's a business major. He under, I didn't have to explain to him how to upload something. So he's working for us right now and probably in the next month will be on all of those platforms. And I paid him $500. So, so yes, I do t use those opportunities. I haven't used them as much as I probably should have in the beginning. I should have done that more in the beginning. Thank you. But I do it now.